Good evening, everyone. It is uh, my great pleasure uh, to welcome Isha Elanda to Zagreb again. Isha is not uh, such a stranger here. No, okay, he has been uh, to Zagreb a uh, few times and uh, also to Pula, but that's not the reason why he is not a stranger. I would dare say that in the last few years, a couple of his books have become an integral part of the local discussions uh, on uh, anti-fascism and fascism, which is uh, which discussions that are, of course, always historical, but also very much uh, political. So, uh, just to present him uh, very shortly, uh, Isha is a, a historian of uh, modern political uh, thought that uh, who teaches in uh, Israel uh, he, and uh, has a very special interest in the intellectual history of, of fascism. Uh, he has published uh, uh, two of his books which I uh, mentioned uh, made a considerable uh, impact in Croatia but not just in Croatia are especially concerned with uh, some issues on the, uh, of the intellectual history of fascism. Uh, one of them is uh, the book that was, uh, that was translated uh, last year uh, to Croatian, which uh, is in a, a somewhat uh, provocative uh, but very convincing uh, uh, tra tr uh, attempt to trace uh, the um, intellectual uh, roots of uh, some of the fascist thoughts in the uh, classic uh, European classical uh, liberalism. And uh, another one, another of the, his recent books, which was uh, published last year, concerns with uh, another provocative topic, and that is the attitude uh, of uh, fascism to the masses, which actually gives a convincing and uh, somewhat, at, at this day and age, a somewhat unconventional view view of the of this issue and I'm glad to say that uh, we recently found out that the second book fascism and the masses will also be is supposed to be translated and published in in Croatia uh, in Croatia very soon anyway uh, to his today's talk will also be concerned with the intellectual history of uh, fascism and one special um, aspect of it, and that is the aspect of uh, fascist uh, figure of uh, concept of fascist enemy. So, without further ado, uh, Ishai, you will uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for this uh, introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here. I want to thank uh, especially uh, Carolina Herga for uh, extending. Uh, the invitation that you do this, this one. Uh, okay, uh, what I'll try to do here is to look at the fascist concept of the enemy and its uh, distinctive and striking uh, characteristics. Uh, my talk will be accompanied, as you see, by a, a presentation. I don't think I've ever presented such a massive uh, scale nor do I expect to do so in the future, so this is something quite special and I hope everything works out fine. Uh, I'll try to operate the presentation as I'm speaking and if you run into trouble then Nicola will assist me. Uh, one of the things that typify the way fascists conceived of their enemies is its remarkable irrationality and extremity. Uh, this is an uh, antagonism which is often so glaringly illogical, almost absurd, and defies all accepted discursive and demonstrative procedures. The enemy uh, is presented by uh, the fascist as a demon, as someone who, uh, who is not only wrong and dangerous, but as placed uh, beyond all dialogue or negotiation. Uh, it is to be annihilated, in as much as it is a worldview, or even physically exterminated. No real evidence is offered for this extreme and radical enmity, and no counter-arguments are allowed to complicate or attenuate it. It works with a scheme of Manichean uh, totality, where no compromise can be attained. So either light or darkness uh, will prevail. 
So it's often explicitly uh, a battle for life and death. And if I may share with you a personal anecdote, uh, when I was a kid, maybe uh, eight or nine years old, um, we started to be informed in school about uh, Nazism and about the Shoah. And I remember thinking to myself, if I'd been born back then, and I would be able to have a conversation, like a face-to-face -face conversation with Hitler, then surely I would have been able to explain to him that he's wrong, that he's got it all wrong about the Jews, and this would have prevented everything. And looking back, uh, I realized that this was uh, a bit naive on my part, uh, but the question continued in other forms to occupy me. And I think that in some sense it remains relevant. Why actually can't this hatred be explained away? The Nazi fear and hatred of Jews or of gypsies, the white supremacist uh, image of black people, the demonization of Muslims by the far right, and so on and so forth. Why can't all these phobias be susceptible to rational debate? I mean, surely if we conduct a rational discussion, like adults or maybe like kids, with a very limited degree of goodwill, we can ultimately agree that all these phobias, if not totally irrational, are uh, at the very least wildly inflated. But as we know, uh, reasonable arguments have proven woefully inadequate in countering the, the rise of fascism um, and Nazism in the interwar years, just as they are pathetically ineffective today facing the uh, recrudescence of far-right extremism. So maybe we need a theory that will account for this non-rational nature of far-right phobias, a theory that will explain what we're up against, and then hopefully might help us to develop a more productive anti-fascist strategy for our own days. Uh, when I argue that um, the fascist concept of the enemy is in some ways uh, distinctive, maybe this requires a short explanation. Uh, of course, fearing uh, enemies, fighting enemies, and exploiting enemies for various instrumental and political reasons is not a fascist uh, innovation. Far from it, it's almost a constant of human history, having countless examples both before and after uh, fascism. What, in my view, distinguishes the fascist concept of the enemy is a certain logical slash illogical uh, configuration, as well as a historical context, a philosophical outlook, and a social purpose. And even these are not exclusive uh, to fascism. So once we grasp the fascist uh, concept of the enemy, we can learn from it about other discourses because there's often an overlap, like a Venn uh, diagram. An enemy, a real or imagined one, had throughout history served to reunite discordant nations and draw them uh, together. And this is particularly, particularly evident in times of war. This is a, a motif recurrent in Shakespeare's historical dramas, as the following passage from the second part of Henry VI illustrates. Clifford, the nobleman, uh, faces a rebellious crowd that's on the verge of toppling down the English monarchy, and he reminds them that they must abandon the uprising in order to defeat the common enemy of both the aristocracy and the plebs. The common enemy is the French. So he tells them, were it not a shame that, whilst you live at Jar, the fearful French, whom you late vanquished, should make a start overseas and vanquish you. It's already in this civil broil, I see them lording it in London streets. To France, to France, and get what you have lost. Spare England, for it is your native coast. The rebels, as can be expected, uh, listen to Clifford's plea. They abandon their leader, Jack uh, Cade, and join the nobles and the king to save uh, England. So this is just uh, one example out of countless possible others about how enemies can uh, be useful and serve 
a purpose, at least for certain people. Jack Cade, leader of the commoners, is not amused, and he complains uh, about the ignominious treason of his followers. And it's possible that Shakespeare doesn't totally uh, disagree with him. The change of heart of the rebels is so abrupt. Clifford just appeals to them, and immediately, without any hesitation, they switch uh, sides, which creates an almost comical uh, effect. And maybe there's also an element of satire involved, since Clifford also tells the rebels that Henry has money. So their newfound patriotism is a bit uh, shady. So what then might have been new about fascism and its use of enemies? I suggest that fascism was operating to prevent a historically new uh, possibility, namely the possibility that modernity might once and for all eliminate war from human existence, that universal and lasting peace will be instituted on the face of the earth. This was an unprecedented uh, prospect which fascists almost universally uh, rejected. Modernity was seen by them, and not only by them, um, as the advance of peace, ushering in a realm of civility and equality. This was seen by Nietzsche, who for me is the most significant and instructive proto-fascist uh, thinker, a thinker either creating or distilling the assumptions of uh, fascism as a cultural revolt, this was seen by Nietzsche as the culmination of the democratic and socialistic uh, slave revolt and the elimination of the masters. The plebeian slaves represented peace and the aristocratic masters the ethos of war. Nietzsche was protesting against that predicament already in an early piece, The Greek State from 1871. He expressed the concern that the bourgeoisie left to its own devices under the normal flow of uh, capitalism and free to persist with the suicidal uh, enlightenment project shall prove its own uh, grave digger. He feared that world peace will render the masses unmanageable and lead inevitably to the collapse of a warlike society founded on the broadest possible base, a slave-like bottom stratum. He thus uh, proposed uh, to counter uh, the pacifistic democratic menace with war. I cannot help seeing, above all, the effects of the fear of war in the dominant movement of nationalities at the present time and in the simultaneous spread of universal suffrage. The only countermeasure to the threatened deflection of the state purpose toward money matters from this quarter is war and war again. If I view all social evils, including the inevitable decline of the arts, as either sprouting from that root or enmeshed with it, then you will just have to excuse me if I occasionally sing a paean to war. So let it be said that war is as much a necessity for the state as the slave for society. The period uh, presents a perhaps unprecedented phenomenon of an all-out war waged on peace. Peace as reality, as a concept and as an ideal, um, a looming possibility was being attacked. The utopia of a peaceful order was being uh, re re rewritten as a dystopia, most forcefully in Nietzsche's vision of the last humans. Nietzsche, Zarathustra presents um, the people with the most contemptible man, and that is the last human. Nobody grows rich or poor anymore. Both are too much of a burden. Who still wants to rule? Who obey? Both are too much of a burden. No herdman and one herd. The last humans uh, incarnate mass society. They epitomize the nightmare of social subversion an egalitarian uh, dystopia, but there's no hint of physical violence uh, on their part. If there is one thing the last humans are not, it's warriors. They are the product of an essentially peaceful revolution consisting of increased consumption and mass happiness. 
Zarathustra says that the last humans still work, for work is entertainment, but they take care the entertainment does not exhaust them. They have their little pleasure for the day and their little pleasure for the night, but they respect health. We have discovered happiness, say the last humans, and blink. From this uh, follows the necessity uh, of the, for an enemy. The enemy is vital in order to detonate the realm of the last humans. The enemy becomes a conduit to a great life, a tragic and heroic one. As Zarathustra lyrically exclaimed, the spear which I throw at my enemies, how I thank my enemies that at last I can throw it. The enemy is thus not simply uh, objectively there, someone who compromises one's interests and needs to be engaged in battle, he is subjectively necessary. The enemy is a friend of sorts because without him the dystopia of the last humans and their perpetual peace would be inescapable. On this, uh, Heidegger, uh, one of Nietzsche's foremost uh, disciples, so to speak, uh, during the 20th century, said, uh, apropos his book, um, Sein und Zeit is uh, magnum opus. I have, even today, still not enough enemies. The book has not brought me a great enemy. This uh, prefigures one of the most notable fascist characteristics, an inversion of end and means. For other regimes, war is a means to an end. Most famously for Clausewitz, uh, war is the continuation of politics by other means. For fascism, however, war is an end in itself, valuable for its own sake, irrespective of its utilitarian logic, its expected benefits. And so Zarathustra say, says, you say it is the good cause that hallows even war. I tell you it is the good war that hallows every cause. And this is then inherited by fascism and reflected in its attitudes Let's look at Mussolini's words. Fascism does not, generally speaking, believe in the possibility or utility of perpetual peace. War alone keys all human energies to their maximum tension. Fascism carries this anti-pacifistic attitude into the life of the individual. Or Hitler, as a young Scamp, in my wild years, nothing had so grieved me as having been born at the time which obviously erected its halls of fame only to shopkeepers and government officials. This development was expected in time to remodel the whole world into one big department store. Even as a boy, I was no pacifist, and all attempts to educate me in this direction came to nothing. And this means uh, that the fascist needs enemies to infuse meaning uh, into life in case real enemies are lacking. He is obliged to create them. A very revealing illustration of this fact is the following passage by Heidegger shortly after uh, the installment of the Nazis in power. It starts with a seemingly objective statement. The enemy is one who poses an essential threat to the existence of the folk and its members. The enemy is not necessarily the outside enemy, and the outside enemy is not necessarily the most dangerous. Here uh, we are more or less on traditional conceptual ground. There's an enemy, he objectively poses a very uh, serious threat, and we need to defend ourselves against him. But the continuation is decisively more subjectivist and underlines the need for enemies. It may even appear that there is not an enemy at all. The root requirement is then to find the enemy, to bring him to light, or even to create him, in order that there may be that standing up to the enemy and that existence not become stolid, stumpf in German. Here, uh, a space is opened up for a certain arbitrariness in designating the identity of the enemy. The enemy is essentially a role that must be performed. The role pre-exists any specific uh, group, and now a casting of sorts will be conducted 
conducted uh, to find the actor who will best embody the enemy. Uh, in this case, of course, there is one uh, overwhelming candidate to take this uh, thankless job. Commentators on this passage usually assume that the enemy Heidegger is referring to is uh, the Jew or the Jews. And this is by no means wrong. We know that Heidegger was profoundly complicit in the anti-Semitic discourse of the German contemporary right, and he shared many of their crude uh, stereotypes. He subsequently writes of the enemy who has grated himself onto the innermost root of the existence of a folk who opposed the letter's own most essence, acting contrary to it, and so on, which uh, clearly repeats the standard complaints against the Jews as a supposedly foreign uh, and corrosive implants in the organism of the otherwise healthy uh, German folk. But notice that the enemy is there not just to threaten the folk, but also to perform an indispensable redeeming uh, task, to prevent existence from becoming dull and meaningless. So had the enemy not, existence, uh, not existed, it would have been necessary to create him. And this with the goal of blowing up the peace of the last humans, prevent dullness. This is Heidegger's way of revolting against the dictatorship of Das Mann, uh, the day in English, which is basically Heidegger's versions of, uh, version of Nietzsche's uh, last humans. And we know that Nietzsche, for one, did not share the Nazi uh, outright hatred uh, for Jews, and he would have, with all certainty, have disapproved of their persecution, to say nothing about their massacre. But still, enemies for Nietzsche too must be found, or else Zarathustra's spears won't be uh, discharged. This is uh, confirmed if we turn to another paradigmatic case, maybe even more famous in this context um, than Heidegger, uh, I'm referring to Carl Schmitt's mythical friend-enemy dichotomy. Schmitt's ostensible aim was to objectively identify the core of the political as such, which he located in this opposition between the friend and the enemy. But in reality, his goal was to impede the utopia of the last humans, to dystopianize it, just like Nietzsche and Heidegger uh, have done. He was so keen to emphasize that the friend-enemy dichotomy is something permanent, precisely because of, he was afraid that it might, in fact, be transcended, that peace might be attained. He worried that war would be superseded and that class society would be abolished. And so he admonished his readers in his highly influential 1932 treatise, The Concept of the Political. Were a world state to embrace the entire globe and humanity, then it would be no political entity and could only be loosely called a state. If, in fact, all humanity and the entire world were to become a unified entity based exclusively on economics and on technically regulating traffic, then it still would not be more of a social entity than a social entity of tenants in a tenement's house customers purchasing gas from the same utility company, or passengers traveling on the same bus. An interest group concerned exclusively with economics or traffic cannot become more than that in the absence of an adversary. It would know neither state, nor kingdom, nor empire, neither republic, nor monarchy, neither aristocracy, nor democracy, neither protection, nor obedience, and would altogether lose its political character. And this is a clear reformulation of what uh, Zarathustra tells us when he war warns against the last humans. And it's also very much an attempt to conceptually denigrate Marx's vision of the realm uh, of freedom. And again, the adversary, the enemy, becomes necessary to prevent the state from withering away, as Marx and Engels uh, put it. Schmidt presents this as an impending tragedy, the elimination of political meaning from human life, but it is only so from the perspective of those profiting from the current hierarchical, exploitative, and belligerent order. And he is also well aware of the fact that the masses are actually 
quite interested in seeing this order superseded. Like the people at the marketplace who laughingly tell Nietzsche's uh, prophet, give us this last human, O Zarathustra. Make us into this last human. You can have the overman. So Schmidt writes in a preparatory work to the concept of the political from 1929, the age of uh, neutralization and depoliticization, um, great masses of industrialized peoples today still cling to a torpid religion of technicity because they, like all masses, seek radical results and believe subconsciously that the absolute depoliticization sought after for centuries can be found here and that universal peace begins here. And again, to destroy this mass dream, an enemy is necessary, as Schmidt goes on to proclaim. Whoever knows no other enemy than death and recognizes in his enemy nothing more than an empty mechanism is nearer to death than life. For life struggles not with death, spirit not with spiritlessness. Spirit struggles with spirit, life with life. And out of the power of an integral understanding of this arises the order of human things. And this claim that one can struggle uh, with death uh, can be disputed and would probably be disputed by the authors of Games of Thrones. The enemy, as Schmidt conceives of him, is also eminently functional as cynical. It is a myth. The crucial thing is that internal unity be gained in order to face an external enemy, whether real or uh, imagined. Writing in 1923, Schmidt is enthusiastic about the way Italian fascism employs the myth of a national enemy to overcome internal class strife. But wherever it comes to an open confrontation of the two myths, such as in Italy, the national myth has until today always been victorious. Italian fascism depicted its communist enemy with a horrific face, the Mongolian face of Bolshevism. This has made a stronger impact and has evoked more powerful emotions than the socialist image of the bourgeois. The way that fascism inherited the crusade against the last human is expressed by another notable uh, 20th century neo-Nietzschean, uh, Ernst Jünger, who wrote the following. Nietzsche's uh, prophecy of the last humans has found rapid fulfillment. It is accurate, except for the assertion that the last human lives longest. His age already lies behind us. When do you think this was written? The answer was, uh, okay, you guessed correctly, 1934, that is shortly after the Nazis' installment in power. I now wish to uh, briefly explore some of the ramifications of this fascist concept of the enemy. The first is its uh, radicalism. One might imagine that against a constructed enemy, the struggle would be rather mild. That one would be able to attenuate the rivalry, make compromises, and so on. In fact, the opposite is the case. The struggle is conducted with particular ferocity and knows few, if any, uh, limits. The need for a radical break with the last humans necess necessitates extremity up to and includes the, including extermination. Now, why is this the case? Precisely because the enmity has to be inflated into mythical uh, dimensions and because it has to function as a dynamite to explode the entire order resting on peace and ease. Extermination and radicalism are not a response to a concrete reality, however misperceived. Rather, they form the telos of the whole uh, move. It produces the, its object of hatred in order to justify itself and unleash its fury and destruction. The goal is to destroy, to exterminate. This produces a description, a demonization and dehumanization of the enemy to justify its extermination. Total dehumanization doesn't justify extermination as much as extermination produces dehumanization. 
And the progression is not from the enemy to extermination, but from extermination to the enemy. You can see this um, at work in both Nietzsche and Heidegger. Let's start with Nietzsche, who writes in Ecce Homo, a tremendous hope speaks out of this writing. Let us look a century ahead. Let us suppose that my attentat on two millennia of anti-nature and the violation of man succeeds. That party of life which takes in hand the greatest of all tasks, the higher breeding of humanity, together with the remorseless extermination of all degenerate and parasitic elements, will again make possible on earth that superfluity of life out of which the Dionysian condition must again proceed. Extermination becomes the precondition for attaining uh, greatness. And Heidegger writes, it is often much harder and more exhausting to seek out the enemy as such than to lead him to reveal himself, to avoid nurturing illusions about him, to remain ready to attack, to cultivate and increase constant preparedness and to initiate the attack on a long-term basis with the goal of total extermination. Notice that uh, Heidegger is talking here about total extermination of an enemy which, according to his own admission just a few lines uh, before, might have, have to be created. And this again testifies to the futility of rational discussion. It would make no sense at all trying to convince Heidegger and other fascists that the enemy is a fiction because they require precisely this fiction to enact their revolt against the last humans. This linkage between utter radicalism and the fight against peaceful modernity is illustrated by a great number of post-war uh, fascist and neo-Nazis. One prime example is the theories of someone who is perhaps the most extreme US-American uh, neo-Nazis, William Luther Pierce, whose notorious uh, book, The Turner Diaries, has become the Bible for the most uh, extremist fringes of the American uh, far right. This book is so extreme that it makes Mein Kampf appear as almost moderate and kind of mild by comparison. It fictionally depicts uh, a rebellion of American white supremacists, which ends with the extermination of all uh, blacks and Jews, uh, replete with passages of utmost brutality, uh, sadism, and viciousness. But the point I want to make here is twofold. First, its description of the race enemy is so extreme as to verge on lunacy. It clearly bears no relation at all with reality. For example, the way he describes blacks it seems like, you know, 70% of the time, blacks are described raping uh, white women. 20% of the time, when they're not raping white women, they are uh, verbally uh, molesting them. And the time that remains, like 10%, they are doing other obscene and obnoxious things, like pissing from bridges and so on and so forth. So this is a totally uh, crazy uh, account, but the author was, strictly speaking, uh, not mad. He was even a physicist, rather brilliant uh, individual, who was apparently an intelligent person in his own way. But the complete demonization of the other races and their supporters is meant to facilitate a struggle for life and death, to justify the striving for apocalypse and extermination. This is the, the former quote, I believe in the real world, the unforgiving world of nature in which we evolved through hard and bloody struggle over millions of years. Perhaps it's not a nice world, but it still can be a beautiful world if one looks at it with the right attitude. And why uh, this uh, striving? This is the second point uh, I want to make. It is very much intended to destroy the reality of American mass uh, society. Pierce is an enthusiastic uh, Nietzschean, like so many others on the American uh, far right and alt right today. So he writes things like these against the last humans. If the freedom of the American people were the only thing at stake, the existence of the organization would hardly be justified. Americans have lost the right to be free. 
Slavery is the just and proper state for a people who have grown as soft, self-indulgent, careless, credulous, and befuddled as we have. The average white American has become a mass man, a member of the great brainwashed proletariat, a herd animal, a true democrat. What the, uh, the organization began doing about six months ago is treating Americans realistically, for the first time, namely, like a herd of cattle. Since they are no longer capable of responding to an idealistic appeal, we began appealing to things they can understand, fear and hunger. We will take the food off their tables and empty their refrigerators. Notice that this is how he treats the huge majority of people of his own race, uh, so to speak, uh, white people. And at the end of the apocalyptic war described in the book, it's actually the fact that uh, a huge number of whites also get killed. I don't remember exactly, like 70% of American whites. So uh, in a sense, the fight against Jews and blacks become, becomes a conduit for fighting and getting rid of the American average person, as of course, as Pierce imagines him to be. Another white uh, supremacist, uh, Gregory Hood, wrote much more recently, we know that this farce you call a country is a nightmare that just rolls on and on, and we want no part of it. We are not willing to die to make the world safe for garbage food, garbage culture, and garbage people, but we are willing to work and, if need be, fight for an organic society worthy of service and sacrifice. So one fights other races in order to purify oneself. One requires the total enemy, the fabrication of a demon, to take down the ignominious. This leads to another question, uh, that of fascist and particularly uh, Nazi uh, racism. Nazi racism is often seen as the ultimate proof that Nietzsche wasn't actually a proto-Nazi uh, because he didn't believe in crude biological determinism. He was contemptuous of contemporary Germans and never tired of pointing out that they were a mixed rather than a pure uh, race. Yet, uh, this line of argumentation suffers from several flaws. For one thing, we see how inveterate Racists like Pierce and Hood can be immensely contemptuous of their fellow race members, and this on rather similar grounds to those invoked by Nietzsche. And in fact, both people are uh, very influential, directly uh, influenced by, by Nietzsche. Secondly, this ar argument misrepresents both Nietzsche's stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, racism and the Nazi one. Nietzsche is uh, construed as anti-racist, whereas the Nazis are seen as believers in crude biologism. The realities with regards to both Nietzsche and the Nazis were, in fact, much more uh, complex. Much of the supposed opposition between Nietzsche and the Nazis collapses once we take into consideration precisely the mythical, as opposed to the strictly factual nature of ra racism. Race for the Nazis was equally about myth-making as it was about science and biology, maybe even more so. And once we realize this, we see that Nietzsche can no longer be seen as the skeptical and ironic other of racism. Nietzsche may have rejected the reality of race purity, but he did not deny its value as a myth, leading to a transformative uh, project. Let's see how this played itself out in an 8081 passage called The Purification of the Race. At the beginning, Nietzsche affirms that pure race, races do not exist, in a way which seems to drive a wedge between uh, his conviction and that of the racist. There are probably no pure races, but only races that have become pure, and even these being extremely rare. What is normal is cross races, in which, together with the disharmony of physical features, there must always go a disharmony of habits and value concepts. Livingstone heard someone say, God created white and black men, but the devil created the half-breeds. But even here, in these uh, last words, uh, we ominously sense that Nietzsche is, if anything, a rather hesitant critic uh, of an opponent of racism, and as he goes on, we learn that 
the project of racism he didn't oppose and in fact uh, endorsed. In the end, however, if the process of purification is successful, races that have become pure have always also become stronger and more beautiful. The Greeks offer us the model of a race and culture that has become pure. And hopefully we shall one day also achieve a pure European race and culture. And this is not unlike uh, the doctrines of many race the theorists in Nazi Germany. Uh, notable authors like Hans F.K. Gunther, uh, Ludwig Ferdinand Klaus, or Fritz Lenz, to name but a few, did not claim that race purity was already a given in Germany, but on the contrary, they sought to produce it. They were painfully aware of the degraded and mixed condition of modern Germans, and moreover, so racism fundamentally as a spiritual and metaphysical question involving matters of values rather than crude physical realities. Race purity thus became a leading ideal, a project and a myth, only weakly connected to or dependent on any empirical or scientific uh, proofs. As Nazi geneticist and eugenicist Fritz Lenz wrote, to give just one example, although in the world of facts, race does not exist as a cohesive unity, the significance of facts in the world of values is not great. Race, as we see, functioned uh, as the myth, the myth of the 20th century, as Alfred Rosenberg uh, famously put it. And in this, science as a procedure of careful observation, deduction, and documentation played a merely subsidiary uh, role. If anything, we are dealing here with a gay uh, science, science transmuting into art, uh, whose goal is not to discover facts as much as to create them, guided by an aesthetic and ethical vision. This leads to a third and final ramification of the fascist concept of uh, the enemy, or perhaps better said, one of its preconditions. Uh, what we now refer to as post-truth. Uh, this is often rightly diagnosed as connected to fascism and typical of the intellectual climate fostered by the re-emerging uh, far right, uh, that the enemy can be, in principle, arbitrarily chosen and then persecuted with utmost radicalism and even annihilated is strongly connected to this uh, project of detonating the modernity uh, of the last humans. And once again, it was Nietzsche who showed the way with his dismissal of truth as a metaphor, a ploy used by the weak to enslave the strong. Whereas what truly exists is not binding universal truths or a binding uh, morality, but uh, only perspectives and values. And if this is true, uh, with or without quotation marks, then lying isn't necessarily wrong and telling the truth isn't necessarily right. Both truth and lies should be judged, as Nietzsche put it in a short and highly influential early essay, in an extra moral sense, with a view to their contribution to one's sense of power and um, elevation which again means that debating the nature of the enemy resists a rational uh, discussion and is immune to any proofs or to any counter evidence. The enemy is useful to facilitate a tragic and heroic renaissance and overcome the tepid universal fraternity of the present and the future. Hence is value which a rational critique can uh, do absolutely nothing to diminish. I wish to emphasize uh, again that this assault on truth does not happen in an epistemological uh, vacuum, but within a clear social and historical context, and that the aesthetic choices are intimately connected with class struggle and the bid to destroy uh, modernity. That this is so is tellingly attested to at the very beginning of on truth and lie in an extra moral sense. Very significantly, of all the possible examples of human illusion, Nietzsche chooses to direct his attack on the Hegelian notion of progress and humanism. 
He dismisses the idea of world history as a puny notion entertained by some insect-like, if clever, animals on a godforsaken planet. But this illusion of world history, Nietzsche clarifies, only went on, quote, for an arrogant and mendacious minute, since after nature had drawn a few breaths, the star grew cold and the clever animals had to die, unquote. I don't want to go here into um, a critique of the many inconsistencies in Nietzsche's argument in this uh, seminal piece, such as the reliance on nature to dismiss the illusion of uh, world history and the notions of humanity altogether, which then strangely matures into the opposite claims, that humans can in fact know nothing of nature as it really is, and can only grasp nature and its supposed laws in a subjective way uh, via the distorting filter of language and metaphors. What's crucial in the context of the present discussion is the way Nietzsche moves on to blur all distinction between science, art, art and myth. He concludes the piece by praising the intuitive men of ancient Greece for the way they resisted the strict dictates of reason and managed to live a worthy life of great exaltation and suffering, guided by art and myth. And of course, the question must be raised. Why does Nietzsche open up his essay with a scoffing at the progressive illusions of modern men and ends it with an elevation of the reactionary, reactionary and irrational illusions of ancient men? And the answer isn't uh, difficult uh, to obtain. The myth of modern man, Nietzsche sees as depressing and leading up to what he would later call the dead end of the last humans. Those of ancient men he wishes to revive in order to make room for the aristocratic, warring and enslaving uh, overman. Post-fascism and fascism thus brush aside the perceived limitation placed by rationality and the intellect on the path of life and usher in the world of intuition, blood, and race. As put by one of Nietzsche's most important 20th century disciples, another illustrious right-wing Nietzschean, namely Oswald Spengler, concepts kill being and falsify waking being. This is achieved in practice by forcing the voices of the blood to be silenced in the presence of universal ethical principle. Abstract maxims of life are acceptable only as figures of speech. Trite maxims of daily use underneath with life flows onward. Race in the end is stronger than language. And fascism will come to fulfill Nietzsche's dictum. We shall conquer and come to power even without truth. The spell that fights on our behalf is the magic of the extreme, the seduction that everything uh, extreme exercises. We, immoralists, are the most extreme. Of course, this doesn't mean that the enemy of fascism can be uh, chosen quite at random. There's a famous joke about uh, Jews and bicycle riders that a German tells another German do you agree that Jews are the source of all our problems? And the answer is, uh, yes, of course I agree. Jews and bicycle riders. So, you know, the, the response is, uh, why bicycle riders? And he says, why Jews? Um, in order to function as recruiting narrative, the myth has to have some relation to reality, however tenuous and deceptive. It has to be complemented by very serious uh, charges. So it preferably exploits and mobilizes existing phobias, existing traditions. And as I analyzed uh, elsewhere, the Jew came to represent the arch revolutionary, the harbinger of modernity in the fascist imagination, particularly the Nazi one, the very leader of the slave revolt and the producer of democracy and socialism. So he could embody the fascist enemy to perfection. Uh, moving on now toward uh, a conclusion. Assuming that this analysis of fascist extremity and irrationality is correct, what implications does it have for us now? 
in the face of a new toxic wave of right-wing uh, extremism. If fascism is beyond reasoning and discourse, how can we do anything to counter its advances? Is our analysis little more than a scholarly uh, exercise, which is politically futile? I think that uh, there are some operative uh, conclusions to this analysis. For one thing, while it is uh, pointless to try to engage fascists in debate, it is necessary to highlight their lies and the way that lying and myth-mongering are not incidental, but are hardwired into their worldview. And if this is done insistently enough, and while highlighting also its class interests, it can help to reduce their appeal. But there's an even more important uh, conclusion, I think. Once we have identified what the fascists have tried and are trying to destroy, we need to rally to its defense in a much more uh, decisive uh, way. I say much more decisive, but uh, often this actually means to begin defending it uh, in the first place. We know that the last humans have been attacked by the left as well. The whole tradition of left-wing thought positioned itself against modernity and was quite disdainful of the masses. And it's uh, very easy to compile a long list of venerous, illustrious left Nietzscheans and indeed even left Heideggerians and left uh, Schmittians. This uh, partial convergence reflects the fact that many on the left, for many on the left too, modernity is not lovable. It's seen as devoid of meaning and purpose, a rather depressing, uh, sordid reality. The left as a rule of thumb, I would say, doesn't particularly love the last humans. They are either denigrated outright, snubbed or preached to, or at most they are grudgingly uh, tolerated. And it's difficult to effectively defend something that one doesn't really love. Maybe we need to employ a discourse which emphasizes that the last humans are in fact lovable and therefore defensible. This emphasis uh, on love may appear a bit <laughs> out of place, you know, kind of an emotional appeal, which has uh, little to do with the Marxism or any other cool-headed political approach. But I'm not so sure this is uh, true. Let's consider the case of Georg Lukács, one of the greatest Marxist intellectuals of the 20th century, uh, who is now uh, being vilified in his native country, Hungary, and I think his archive has already been closed down in a shameful act of uh, intellectual uh, repression. Lukács once posited the problem of great literature in strikingly uh, emotional terms, which one would probably not expect in a Marxist literary critic. He wrote, the question grows essential and decisive only when we examine concretely the position taken up by the writer. What does he love and what does he hate? It is thus that we arrive at the deeper interpretation of the writer's true Weltanschauung, at the problem of the artistic value and fertility of the writer's worldview. And for Lukács, the great uh, realists of uh, world literature like Balzac and Tolstoy were motivated precisely by their love for the common people and identification with their aspirations and sufferings. And it seems to me that if it is to emerge uh, victorious, modernity needs to be defended as lovable, as a mass project, a project of the last humans. At present, this is not done passion passionately enough, uh, if at all. Fascism is indeed hated, but what the fascists hate is not loved. The case in point uh, would be uh, consumerism and mass consumption. For fascists, the pleasure and comfort seeking of the masses was contemptible. We already gave several classical examples, like the case of Hitler uh, criticizing department stores. Now we can look at Mussolini very shortly. You can read for yourself. He speaks about a Finnish, a Finnish philosopher asking him to, tell, to summarize the core of fascism, and he tells him in German, we are against the comfortable uh, life. This is uh, Mussolini. 
And on today's far right, this position continues. Let's listen to Götz Kubitschek, uh, one of the leading ideologists behind the Alternative for Deutschland. You had only to go to uh, the shopping center on a Saturday morning and observe people in their consumption temple to see how there is nothing at all there spiritually. Now, suppose that we take uh, this sentence uh, of Kubitschek in isolation. How many left-wing people would subscribe to this message? How many would see it as fundamentally uh, wrong? And in fact, uh, you know, I can tell you from personal experience that it's not just theoretical, because often in teaching or in lecturing, I use a, a small sleight of hand, maybe a little nasty, and I give a citation by Orkheimer criticizing mass consumerism and production of false needs and so on. And when I finish, I tell them, you want to know what my problem with this passage? This isn't Orkheimer, this is Julius Evola, the far right, you know, kind of extremist Nazi, Italian Nazi, who defined himself as standing to the right of Nazism. And so far, no one ever told me, you know, there's something problematic here. This can't be Orkheimer because at least here, there is a definite uh, overlap. I think that to counter fascism, we need to embrace a dialectical understanding of capitalism, which is attuned to the kind of complex nature of capitalism as a social system, which combines civilizing and barbaric elements, civilizing and barbaric uh, vectors. You know, the notion of uh, civilizing uh, aspects of capitalism is actually, actually comes from Marx. And shopping, to uh, look at this example, uh, can indeed in some uh, respects be a depressing uh, practice. You know, we know that for many people they don't even have the money to uh, do any significant shopping and even those who do often feel manipulated, cheated, and we face tremendous inequalities. One gets out of a mall and see, sees uh, homeless people uh, on the street. So we seek happiness that capitalism knows how to promise but we know that only our wherewithal entitles us to it, and being poor, uh, we will mercilessly go to the war. Remember that for the last humans, consumption, or the consumption of the last humans, was attacked precisely in the transcending of class society and economic differences. Who grows rich? Who grows poor anymore? Both are too much of a burden. Also, after the Second World War, uh, the Second World war Schmidt could attack what he called the happiness of pure consumption. But he didn't see it as strictly capitalist. Far from it, Schmidt emphasized this, that this uh, vision was common to both the capitalist West and the communist East. And in fact, he associated the utopia of mass consumerism rather with Engels and Lenin and their connection with the worldwide masses more than he did with capitalism. Similarly, hierarchy, struggle, and war are presented by fascists as uplifting. Equality and peace are seen as insipid, an inferior way of life. But whereas war is being rejected by anti-fascists, I'm not quite uh, convinced that equality is defended with as much conviction and passion as it deserves. Maybe um, this um, equality is taken for granted, I don't know. But there's the possibility that it's not really uh, an entirely believed in. And we need possibly to instill equality with a sense of awe. And here someone like uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton might be of help. Dickens's revolt was simply and solely the eternal revolt. It was the revolt of the weak against the strong. He disliked a certain look on the face of a man when he looks down on another man. And that look on the face is indeed the only thing in the world that we have really to fight between here and the fires of hell. And elsewhere he wrote uh, possibly one of the most eloquent defenses of the idea of equality. And I think that there is something indicative as well as a little uh, sad that Chesterton uh, wasn't precisely a man of the left. This is what he wrote. 
Equality is not some crude fairy tale about all men being equally tall or equally tricky. It is an absolute of morals by which all men have a value invariable and indestructible and a dignity as intangible as death. In truth, it is inequality that is the illusion. We find a man famous and cannot live long enough to find him forgotten. We see a race dominant and cannot linger to see it decay. It is the experience of men that always returns to the equality of men. Nor is it vain that these Western Democrats have sought the blazonry of their flag in that great multitude of immortal lights that endure behind the fires we see. For veritably, suns and moons and meteors pass and fill our skies with a fleeting and almost theatrical conflagration. And wherever the old shadow stoops upon the earth, the stars return. And one of the things I really appreciate here is this kind of double meaning in the emphasis on stars. Because today we think about stars as designating the exceptional sports stars and celebrities and so on. And here, uh, sort of counterintuitively, Chesterton is talking about the average human beings. In its little combination of irrationalism, barbarity, and extremism, the fascist concept of the enemy has succeeded in turning the fascists themselves into the sworn enemies of humanity. Only that this wasn't an invented or theoretical or a mythical enemy, but a very real and concrete one. So effectively, uh, defending the project of the lost humans is a vital task and a great challenge. And it may be that success or failure in fending off the fascist onslaught will in no small measure uh, depend on it. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Ishai. And uh, I apologize to the audience for this uh, presentation. It's, it can be tricky to, to work. Uh, so I would like to ask you if anybody has a quick question. If not, I can, I can start and, okay. There is already somebody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Latko Harap, and uh, this is the question. Uh, could uh, the fascist concept of the enemy be applied to uh, class struggle among uh, the exploitators and the exploited laborers? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. As I it's one of the things that I was emphasizing, that uh, this occurs in a very clear social and political context. And we see this notion of enmity, of radicalism, uh, as a response of threatened uh, social elites. You know, all the people that I've been discussing here are basically middle and upper class uh, ideologies, and they are defending class exploitation you know, against so-called slaves, the modern proletariat that seeks to uh, transform society. So it's very much, uh, has to be seen in class uh, context. In fact, Nietzsche once says that exploitation is, you know, of all things, the, the most mild form of violence. You know, so he tells people, if you're exploited, count your blessings, because this is the, you know, the best that you, uh, that you can get. You know, so obviously this is very much an apologia for capitalist uh, class hierarchy. And as I suggested, it's a defense of all the barbaric potentialities of the capitalist order while blocking the transcendence of capitalism that Marxists, that socialists were counting on and the fulfillment of its more civilizing uh, thrust. Okay, there is another question behind. Uh, good day. My name is Petr Bagaric. Uh, is there room to talk about uh, certain fetishism of greatness in, inside of academia? There's a cultivated uh, process of uh, acquiring um, fascination toward some great names and, uh, and to, toward the building perception of their 
uh, exquisite position in the order of human beings, and also uh, our, mm, the cultivation of certain mode of attention, our ability, or our, um, or our uh, of, for us to be willing to read some 10 or 20 years, three authors, and to pay attention, like I know some monk in meditation, to search layers and layers of uh, meaning, there's a there's a something to it, I think, because mm, that a certain uh, aristocratic perception of our own um, uh, role in society. I know it, 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 to me, it's, there's something um, resonating here a bit. I don't know what you think. Um, yes, I, I think you're definitely onto something that uh, you know, academia with its certain advantages and more generally not just academics, intellectuals um, sometimes, I wouldn't want to generalize, sometimes they do uh, tend to think of themselves as uh, superior to the common throng. So this has been known to uh, to happen, it's, it's undeniable and we, there are uh, you know analysis of this like Bourdieu when he talks about Homo Academicus, there's a, there's a brilliant uh, book by uh, you know classic very polemical book about the intellectuals and the masses where he describes the impact that Nietzsche had in inspiring uh, generations of especially um, British uh, intellectuals in his case, but actually it's a pan-European phenomenon. So yes, there is a kind of seduction of, of greatness, of uh, leading the masses, even leading the leaders. You know, many fascists thought of themselves as basically giving advice uh, to the actual uh, fascist leaders, they often were very disappointed when they realized that they didn't count for so much. So I think it's real, but at the same time, we, should be, uh, we shouldn't develop this uh, anti-intellectual phobia because then we might risk replicating, of course, some of the fascists' own uh, uh, phobias. And we should remember, uh, as I tried to point out, that one of the things that they hated most was this kind of rational analysis careful scientific argumentation, counter-argumentation, they dismiss this as barren dialectic. So I would say, yes, the danger exists, but there is also a very strong uh, anti-intellectual uh, you know, vector that runs through uh, the fascist uh, worldview and the fascist uh, position. Okay, I don't see any hands, so I will take the opportunity to ask a question, ask a question myself. So it's a rather a terminological question. You speak about fascism. Uh, fascism is one of your uh, key interests in research. However, all your work basically proves that uh, what we consider as basic tenets of fascism is part of a European or Western intellectual or Western thought for a period of time that is significantly longer than what we usually uh, uh, call fascism. And uh, this is something that actually causes quite a lot of problems while discussing uh, or not just historical but also com contemporary political issues. So while you can clearly prove that there are some, uh, uh, some uh, 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 political uh, ambitions in the con contemporary far right that have similarities or are uh, outright uh, identical to, to the ones of historical fascism, it proves to somehow controversial to, um, to call uh, uh, contemporary far right outright uh, fascism. Uh, you always have this uh, type of discussion, you know, how can they be fascist? They don't have Hitler's mustache, don't uh, wear uniforms, sometimes even don't uh, consider Jews as the main problem or consider Muslims or some, <coughs> some such thing. So how to handle this sort of uh, uh, terminological difficulties, especially in the, in the kind of work that you do, and uh, perhaps um, avoid this kind of you know, fascism uh, proto-fascism, post-fascism, etc., etc. If we can, if we can clearly see that there is a continu continuity of uh, anti-democratic, anti-socialist, anti-modernist, etc., uh, etc. Et thought. Yes, uh, thank you. It's a very thoughtful uh, question. A bit difficult to to handle uh, theoretically in a, in, you know, in a short response. Um, 
I think that you're right. I'm trying to get at a certain view of fascism as, in a way, an ideal type. Excuse me for borrowing something from Max Weber, who was himself indebted to Nietzsche. But, you know, when we get, it, I presented this at the beginning, we try to distill the essence of fascism, we can learn a lot about phenomenon that may not be 100% uh, uh, fascist, and um, yeah, and we can, you know, argue about how exactly to pinpoint them, define them. To me, to look today at movements such as the alt-right, call it fascist, call it semi-fascist, we can learn so much from the experience of fascism that it makes the whole exercise worthwhile. I don't want to go into air splitting and so on. And of course, Mussolini didn't have the Hitler mustache either, so wasn't he a fascist? You know, we can draw this to, to certain absurdities, I think. But what your point, I definitely accept, and indeed it's part of uh, everything that I try to do, to look at the continuities um, and see, you know, European and Western tradition at work in fascism. It isn't just a break, but it, it's also a break. We need to see this in a kind of a dialectical uh, uh, complexity. But the main thing is, does the study of classical fascism, of interwar fascism, and of proto-fascism, the tradition that came before, is it helpful for us today to analyze what's going on? And I think, and I've tried to bring some examples via Kubitschek, via Pierce, Hood, and many others, that it remains relevant. So we should, you know, the study of the past um, can still help us in facing our dilemmas today. Okay, we have another question from the uh, audience. Um, hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ivan March. I, um, I really enjoyed that, but I also struggled to keep up. Um, I have a certain level of education that I think permits me to understand um, quite a lot of what you presented, but I also work with a lot of social movements and social movement leaders that would have an impossible time grasping a lot of what you said, especially in the answer to the final question you know, short, like sociology shorthand, like I just pretty much just know who Weber is. I don't know much more than that. Um, my background's in natural sciences. So uh, my question is, how do we make all of this research useful in everyday reality? Because I think it really is um, today more than ever. Uh, there seems to be a little need for translating um, in more palatable form, um, some of these ideas. And I don't see that happening in, in the left. I see the right being really concerned with everyday reality and the left kind of getting stuck in a theoretical and, you know, jargonistic world. Um, yeah, thoughts, um, thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, the problem you're, you're pointing to. Uh, in my own efforts, I try as much as I can. I'm an academic, unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately. Uh, I think there, there's absolutely a need to popularize uh, these ideas. And what I am personally trying to do is, uh, the result to Nietzsche is uh, partly explainable by this need to popularize, because there's no uh, greater popularizer among all the philosophers, the Nietzsche. And I think once you use the metaphors, the powerful catchwords that he used, like the overman, the last human, the blonde beast, and so on and so forth, you know, uh, the will to power, it's possible to render much more intelligible things that are at stake. If you, and I think this often gets lost in discussion uh, among um, liberal and left-wing and left-wing um, scholars Partly is because of the specialization, which is uh, unavoidable after all, we're dealing with uh, the difficult texts and it's not always possible to render them um, much simpler. But also I think there is a sociological element in question and here I point very briefly to the problem of left Nietzscheanism. And you see this uh, taking, in my view, very uh, damaging dimension in terms of making language so complex, you pointed to this, you, all the, 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 the rhetoric of deconstruction, of POMO, postmodernism, and so on. I think it's not a coincidence, it has a social logic of building this domain that is inaccessible to wider audience. So it's partly done on design. And I think, yes, everybody who tries to, uh, 
you know, fight this crucial battle today, we'll have to find ways of sort of move away from this ivory tower language and bring this into, into popular uh, struggles and popular consciousness. So I think it is a problem and uh, we definitely need to address it. Uh, yeah, I mean, talks like this are probably not the best place, you know, to popularize and mobilize uh, uh, in a broader context. But, you know, every Facebook meme has to have a theory behind it. So, I mean, we... I expect to have some uh, million uh, watches on YouTube later, <laughs> so... Okay, is there another question, perhaps? I don't see a hand. Okay, I will... Uh, I will continue then, <laughs> if nobody minds. Um, so um, the, the thing that actually interests me uh, a lot is um, you quite convincingly explained uh, why this construction of a dehumanized enemy is um, um, unavoidable or uh, constituent part of uh, fascist ideology. However, and you gave us uh, uh, quite a lot of examples of uh, how this is uh, uh, rhetorically constructed uh, by fascist ideologies. But uh, on the other hand, while we may understand uh, dehumanization uh, through, uh, by fascist ideology, ideologies, uh, it's uh, difficult not to notice that uh, many of these uh, many of this uh, dehumanizing uh, rhetoric actually uh, can spread quite quickly among people who have no special interest in uh, defeating the last human or whatever, who are not especially interested in this. I mean, uh, this sort of uh, quite um, uh, extreme dehumanizing rhetoric is something that's today quite uh, regularly used when in most of Europe when talking about uh, Middle Eastern refugees, for instance. Yeah. In Eastern Europe, especially when talking about Roma people. I mean, the levels of uh, constructed fear and uh, well, basically genocidal uh, ambitions are quite uh, frightening uh, currently. And, and the way that they, they tend to spread uh, among the, the general population. So, I mean, the question would be um, if this is possible, if such sort of uh, fascist uh, rhetoric is capable of spreading so quickly in the general population, it must be answering some sort of, um, some sort of need, some sort of uh, fear. So we can, to play a devil's advocate, we can, uh, you know, accept or uh, play with those sorts of theories that said, oh, but it's basic human nature, we always feel stranger, etc., etc. But there is also another uh, possible explanation that it's not connected to an abstract human nature, but it's connected to a very concrete type of society we live in. So, just your thoughts about this. Yes, well, I obviously agree with you. It's not uh, the direct product of human nature, which is anyway always in the process of changing. And yeah, you pointed out to something uh, quite correct. There is a difference between the ideology that is propagated from above and its hidden agenda, and I've tried to expose some of it here, and the way it has to be disseminated to the public. You know, so fascist elitism has this double play. So it has this esoteric dimension, you know, which is really elitist, and, but you have to sell it to broader audiences, so you have to uh, you know, pretend that you care about people and so on. Today's hostilities, um, you know, it, um, the hate that spreads among the masses is the result of a crisis um, of capitalism and fear-mongering, and we see a, a politics of austerity, you know, a divide and rule. We see it everywhere where I come from, Israel. I, uh, it's a painful uh, everyday reality of playing out different oppressed groups against each other. You know, so basically uh, what makes the rulers uh, patriotic and nationalistic, not the fact that they do anything uh, good, you know, for the Jewish masses or for any other uh, ethnic majority, but the fact that they make it hard, you know, for the minorities. So basically, you know, the reality, we're not going to intervene. You will, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog universe. This is what you have to accept. There is no money for social spending and so on. You are um, a dog in your canal, and that's the reality that you... Uh, 
need to accustom yourselves to. Our job is to make sure that this other frightening dog, you know, that is more angrier than you, that suffers more, stays out outside your canal and is treated even badly. So it's, you know, you see there is a, a sense of marketing of these elite needs and trying to couch them in, um, you know, patriotic uh, um, lingo. So perhaps somebody else? No, I think I don't see a hand. Yeah. Okay, I will continue if uh, somebody wants to comment, just wave more energetically so I can see you from here. Um, anyway, uh, another I'll thing. I'll make a short comment, you know, I felt, uh -huh. you know, about the Game of Thrones slide. Almost ironically, the spoiler was uh, broken, like it's typical of Game of Thrones. You can't, uh, you know, so it was exposed. Yeah, there were several moments like that, but uh, as I said, this is uh, a bit difficult to... Yeah, to yeah, yeah, sure. I, I thank you so much for bearing with me, because it's, <laughs> it's difficult and the, the citations are broken into so many... Uh, yeah. Anyway, I wanted to go back to the notion of post-truth, which is a bit uh, controversial, uh, especially on the left, you know, when this... Uh, idea appeared um, it very quickly you know st uh, started being some sort of a, like a mainstream uh, a mainstream idea uh, it and it quit, uh, very quickly you know even um, uh, breached into um, uh, structural fund uh, funds uh, and uh, uh, this sort of t uh, ngo tender uh, uh, tender universe um, what I, uh, well, the, the point is that uh, basically the way it's mostly used, uh, this notion of post-truth today, is um, illustrated by a website I uh, saw uh, just today, which basically uh, divides English language media into uh, left-wing biased, right-wing biased, and non-biased. And uh, it uh, does this by employing um, an algorithm which basically uh, it identifies words that are supposed to be left-wing or right-wing and uh, the idea is that uh, the creators of algorithm who identify the specific word which are biased are non-biased. So, I mean, this is the, the sort of uh, um, the sort of idea that uh, is uh, mostly uh, employed by, while using the term post-truth. And that is exactly why it's often criticized from the left. It's an attempt, you know, it's a, an, another uh, kind of a horseshoe theory uh, kind of um, idea that tries to say, um, you know, the, the truth is in the middle and you have this uh, extremist on the right and left, which are basically the same and uh, they're blah, 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 uh, lying, etc., etc. You, uh, in a way, rehabilitate the idea of uh, post-truth, actually try to employ it in a, useful, in a useful sense. So I just wanted to ask you, how do you like to respond to the criticism of, of the notion itself? Yeah, well, thank you again. That's a thoughtful uh, commentary. I didn't think about it so much. But uh, yes, as you rightfully uh, pointed out, I think that post-truth needs to be situated at the very center. It's not a marginal thing, and it's definitely not left, and it's right, and it's also, you know, fascism has been described sometimes as the radicalism of the center, okay, the extremism of the center. This is, I think, what we need to emphasize, that this attack on truths, attack on rationality, it's not some weirdos on the fringes that are to blame, but we have to look at the very leading philosophers, you know, in the European tradition that at some point decided that truth wasn't serving their interest anymore. Therefore, we have to look at something else. And this entire switch from rationalism and respect for the truth to a sense of myth and gay science that occurred somewhere down the line in the 19th century still uh, is very constitutive of the mainstream. You know, we are not talking about, uh, you know, all the people that I've discussed may be extremists, but they feed off, you know, someone like Nietzsche, who is perhaps the most influential philosopher uh, of modernity, and then Heidegger was uh, considered perhaps the greatest philosopher of the 20th uh, century. So if you locate the origins of, of post-truth to a large extent in their writing, this is obviously an answer to those who will try to say, no, this is like 
the fringe, the characteristics of the far right and far left, when in fact it is constitutive of our culture. Okay, so a last call for a comment, question. If not, then perhaps we can we can close it, not to turn this into an interview, a dialogue. So, okay, thank you everybody, and uh, thank uh, Ishai also, and enjoy the rest of the program. <laughs>